Welcome to the League of Nerds comic book segment number 44. I'm John Cooney here to talk to you about comics released the 5th of December 2012. This week we have a special extended edition because the exceptional week this week. And we'll begin as usual with my first five, meaning these are the first five books I intend to read this week, and I'll go into some more depth on them, starting with at number one, Amazing Spider-Man number 699. I said a few weeks ago in segment number 40 that it takes an amazing book to knock off my then number two book down to number two. So imagine what it takes this week to knock both of those books down a notch. Amazing Spider-Man is the book this week after last issue's shocking ending. Now I'll try to discuss it in a spoiler-free way so that I won't ruin the experience for anybody who hasn't read or heard about it yet. Something I hope writer Dan Slott appreciates since he said, referencing the 698 spoilers, quote, The secret was spoiled online days before it originally came out. The thing that's frustrating about that is a lot of people were just posting the third to the last page on their tumblers and blogs. It was like, dude, come on! I drove Marvel crazy by making everyone swear to secrecy, making sure that nothing was revealed in the solicits and begging not to have any kind of news story that came out on the day. And everyone at Marvel were complete saints with this. They moved heaven and earth to give you an unspoiled story and unfortunately one bad apple spoiled things. In the long run, I think it's going to be good because it really drummed up a lot more interest in the issue. It got more people going to the stores and more people picking it up. So it's a double-edged sword. On one level, I'm glad the book sold so well and it's going back for a second printing. But me, Richard, and everyone who worked on the book would have preferred that you got the chance to read the book and got the surprise where it was supposed to come. It's like, big spoiler warning for Psycho, Norman Bates was dressing up as his mother. I've now grown up in a generation where you know that going in. You know from being a part of pop culture that Norman Bates is his mother and his mother is really dead. So every time someone sees the movie Psycho for the first time, they're walking in already knowing the secret. And that's a completely different experience. I'm not comparing Amazing 698 to the greatness of Psycho. I'm just making an analogy. One of the fun things I've seen on people's Twitter and Facebook accounts is that they're saying that they had a fun time rereading the book. They're now looking for clues on the flip side, but for so many people it meant that they read the book the first time they were actually reading it for the second time, and that's a shame. Close quote. On issue number 699, Slot says, quote, You'll see in issue 699 that this isn't something where we went, let's do a crazy stun out of the blue. You'll see that we've been laying the track for this story since issue 600. This is something we've been building to for quite some time, and many different stories that we've told have actually sown more seeds. There's stuff in this from Ends of the Earth, Spider Island, and several other stories that will become very clear. He also said, referring to 698, quote, I've been watching people's reaction to the last page, and they've leapt to some really big conclusions that will immediately be shattered or confirmed in issue 699. He went on to say, quote, Issue 698 was the magic trick. Issue 699 is where we turn over all the cards. You'll see how we build this bridge to get there. I was very lucky with Marvel Now. The initiative is all about shaking everything up, and a big portion of that was changing creative teams. I had been building this thing for so long, and when I was approached about Marvel Now, I said, We've got this massive change coming up. Up naturally. We've been building this organic development for ages. I told everybody, here's what we're doing. That was enough of a hook for them to go, okay, we'll keep slot on Spider-Man. So thank God I had already been building this bridge. It's fun and it only gets more messed up as we hit the stunning end of Dying Wish and people see where we're really going when we get to Superior. Close quote. At number two, we've got Daredevil End of Days number three. The deadly tale of Daredevil's defining hour continues as Ben Urich tracks down Matt Murdock's past loves to discover the secrets behind his death. But who is the new Daredevil tracking him? I've been very impressed with the first two issues of this series, and I'm not the only one. It's received critical acclaim as well, including a perfect 10 rating by Newsarama, who interviewed series writer and contributing artist David Mack, who said, quote, The response to it has been phenomenal. We are all trying to do the kind of book that we would like to read. We're just happy that so far other people seem to enjoy reading it as well. It's a throwback book in a way. In terms of the current Daredevil with Mark Wade doing such a great job in such a different angle, it's kind of twice as shocking as it normally would be. We didn't know if there would be a backlash to it. We were trying to do our personal love letter to the Daredevil mythos. So far, everybody on the creative team is just really happy with the great response we've had so far. Close quote. Regarding the all-star creative team, Max says, quote, I don't remember exactly when it started, but I think it might have been 2006 when we started working on it. Brian and I co-writing it, and also me and Maliv doing covers and some spots inside, and Bill Sinkevitz and Klaus Jansen doing a majority of the art on the story. It's all these different creators who have each done a large chunk of their career on different Daredevil runs, but also busy with a variety of other things now. It was kind of a logistical feat just to get to work with everybody's schedule, and Brian's so busy with other books as well. Brian kind of has this joke. He was happy with just working on it, just to be able to say that we're doing a project with Bill Sankovitz and Klaus Jensen. Even though it took years for it to come out, we still had the joy of working with them, and being in the process of it, and just being 
able to say we're doing a Daredevil project with them. Mac then explains what it was like writing it with Bendis. Quote, I hadn't co-written with anyone before, and when I'm writing, and I would imagine when Brian's writing, it's a very personal process. I agonize over every little detail. When I first imagined the idea of co-writing, I wasn't so sure how that would be divvied up, or how that would work. But it's actually more fun this way. We'll start by just having a conversation, and one person says something that makes the other person say something. It's almost like having a third mind happen. Close quote. Explaining the impact of the book, Max says, quote, A lot of the power that you're referring to comes from the artwork. I think having Bill Sankovitz and Klaus Janssen, who are so in love with this character, that their art brought something really visceral to it, and something really gritty and weighty. Just having them on the series, from Bill Sankowitz's Daredevil Love and War and Elektra Assassin, some of the stuff he does in this book recalls the approaches he did there. So much of Janssen's work when he was collaborating with Miller as an inker and later as a penciler slash inker on a lot of those stories, they have such a connection to this character. That was one of the really fun parts of it for us as writers. What we wrote on scripts was one thing, but seeing it come back the way they drew it, it was almost like we were seeing it for the first time. It was almost shocking to us. We can only imagine how shocking it was to the readers. And as for the story, Max says, quote, It's pretty intense right off the bat. There's the Daredevil scene right out at the beginning, but then there's another really intense scene with Daredevil later in the story. I don't know if it's almost softened in that way because Daredevil's back in the book for the rest of the story, and you find out what happened before that. It's almost like starting the book in the third act of a story rather than building up to something and having that be the cliffhanger of the first issue, or to happen later in the story. We thought, what's the most powerful way to tell the story, and not necessarily in the exact order that it happened? Fine-tuning and thinking about that kind of thing, and opening it right up with one of the most intense points, and then having the Ben Urich point of view after that. Of this week's issue, Max said, quote, Both issue number two and three include a lot of Matt's former lady interests. It's interesting to see who cooperates with Ben and who doesn't, and what strange situation Ben gets himself into trying to talk to these different people. Sometimes you get an insight from somebody who might give you a first-hand experience of what their last moments with Daredevil were, and other times Ben's just a horrible reminder to them of something they've tried to shut out of their lives. Ben has a history of some of these people, too. He has history with Elektra, for instance, from the Miller Jansen issues. A lot of that is revisited. There's a reason for Ben to be completely scared out of his mind to have a, any communication with these people or to try to find any of them. Typhoid Mary is a character that comes out. He was already trying to find Black Widow. Just seeing Bill Sankovitz do a fully painted pages of Elektra again in the style of Elektra Assassin is amazing. It's almost the exact kinds of takes he did before with Elektra. Visually, it's a feast for Brian and I. When it comes back with the lettering on these pages, it's an amazing experience for us to read it. We can only hope that the readers appreciate it in that way, too. Close quote. At number three, I've got X Factor number 248. By now, if you've listened to my segments for any amount of time, you know that this is consistently one of my favorite books. So for it to fall to number three this week has to demonstrate what an exceptional week this is. But trying to nail down why this is always one of my favorite books, or why more specifically Peter David is one of my favorite writers, I'd have to say it's because, put simply, he's clever. More than just humorous, his writing shows a wit that's both subtle and edgy, yet not sharp or aggressive. His dialogue and group dynamics are simultaneously intelligent and amusing, reminiscent of the repartee and banter of the much-beloved crew of Joss Whedon's Firefly. As for the series, X-Factor is one of a small handful of Marvel titles that's not remodeling under the recent Marvel Now initiative. Although the title just went through some of its own big changes in the five-part Breaking Point storyline, resulting in the departure of Wolfsbane, Strong Guy, Banshee, and Havoc for various reasons, leaving Maddox, Layla, Polaris, Monet, Longshot, Richter, Shatterstar, and of course receptionist Pip the Troll, who was the focus of last issue, which, like Spider-Man number 698 and Wolverine in the X-Men number 18, came with the shocking ending that will apparently be addressed by M in issue 248 based on the book's solicitation. A familiar face hovers between life and death. The only one who can save them is Monet, but it will require reliving the most horrific experience of her life. At number four, we've got Detective Comics number 15. This is a Death of the Family tie-in. What has the Joker done with the Penguin? Guest starring Poison Ivy and Clayface. This issue is the third from series writer John Lehman, who says, quote, I think this is the issue where the story will come into focus and people will see what I'm doing. Three issues in, the format I'm taking will start making sense, Lehman explained. I've also got my sea legs now. I was terrified at first. It was very daunting to be working on something so big and historic with so many eyes on it. By the third issue, I really started to find my groove and think it's the best one we've done. That was really gratifying. I don't want to say I didn't like 13, but there was a lot of second guessing going on there. It moved a little slow and I thought, shoot, if people like 13, they're going to go crazy in a few issues. What I do with the next two issues is tell a story about this is Gotham when Joker is in town. 
Yes, it's got some specifics to death of the family, but if for whatever reason, if you can only buy Detective, I want to give you something satisfying on its own. This shows how the city is effective when Joker's in town, and doesn't necessarily have to be death of the family specific, although it is. I'm not necessarily using the Joker, which is good because this Joker is a little darker than my taste run. Scott Snyder excels at creepy and horrific, and honestly, I wanted my take on Batman to be a little lighter. So I keep Joker on the sidelines, where if you know Joker, you know he's doing all this stuff. I know what happens in every issue of Death of the Family, and it's hardcore. Every issue has something hardcore. Close quote. And at number 5, we've got Invincible number 98, The Death of Everyone, Part 1. The countdown to issue number 100 begins here with the story that'll change everything for Invincible. Mark's powers have finally returned just in time for every life on Earth to rest in his hands. But what will happen when everyone learns that what is happening is Mark's fault? Robert Kirkman told CBR TV about the pressure building up to issue number 100. Yeah, I mean, the pressure is on me. I definitely feel the pressure because... Um, I'm, I, I, I pride myself on the fact that I am a devoted comic book fan and that I read, I've read a lot of 100 issue, I've read a lot of issue 100s, I've read a lot of issue 300s, you know, and I, and I know how these books work and I know, I think, what fan perception is on long running series and stuff like that and so I'm trying to utilize that as a writer and I think that issue 100s and big anniversary issues that get these big sales bumps are uh, jumping off points just as easily as they are jumping on points, you know? Uh, and so I feel a tremendous amount of pressure to make sure that, you know, it's something that will hook a new reader, uh, pay off an old reader, and also not, you know, wrap things up in a satisfying way so that the reader can go, all right, well, look, I'm tired, and also not suck, because if it sucks, you're dead, because then, you know, it's sure. like, oh, well, you know what, I have read 100 issues of this, and I wasn't too into this, so I'm out. Sure. So, I mean, there's a tremendous amount of pressure to try and make sure it's as cool as it can be, but, you know, I've had the luxury of, you know, being able to do whatever I want to do on Invincible, and so I've been able to kind of, you know, map the stories out in a way that they can kind of dovetail into these anniversary issues in a cool way, and, you know, like, you know, introducing Negan and doing what we did issue 100. Uh, I think we've got some really cool stuff coming up in Invincible 100 that will, one, pay off stuff that's been going on in the book for, you know, 10 years, and two, you know, set up a lot of stuff for the future. So hopefully we'll keep readers hooked. Rounding out the top 10 at number 6, we've got all new X-Men number 3, just one week after issue 2. The flagship X-Book marches on. The original 5 X-Men are back, but that's not all that's happening. What happened to the Phoenix 5 from Avengers vs. X-Men? And in this issue, Cyclops' band of fugitive mutants choose a surprising new headquarters. Quarters. At number seven, we've got Avengers number one. This is part of the Marvel Now initiative, relaunching Avengers uh, with writer Jonathan Hickman, who's coming off of the Fantastic Four and FF. The solicit for the book merely says classified, but Jonathan Hickman describes the book as, quote, The premise of the book is that the Avengers need to get bigger, and they need to be able to handle not just global threats in the sense of there's a revolution in Latveria that Doctor Doom is leading and it could spill over into all of Europe. What I mean is there are threats to the entirety of the planet is kind of the scale of what we're talking about. And so that's where we start. We're moving towards Avengers Universe, where you see why you need to team with Hulk and Hyperion and Thor and all these incredibly powerful characters. You see why the team has to be constructed that way because of the stuff that we're building towards. Again, the point of this is not your typical kind of international events that require the Avengers to globetrotting and all of that kind of stuff. We'll start out bigger than that and grow from there. Close quote. At number eight, we've got Before Watchmen Comedian number four. Uh, this is written by Brian Azzarello, whose style really fits the character of the comedian. And uh, for the slits, it's for the Before Watchmen books. They only give you a pull quote out of the book. And the quote for this week for Comedian is, quote, All I could see was red. Then I saw the white and the blue and the pinko, close quote. At number nine, we've got Before Watchmen Minutemen number five. This one's written and drawn by Darwin Cook, who also is an exceptional fit for the style of this book, both in his writing and his artwork. It has that nostalgic, uh, classic feel to it. And the poll quote for this book is, quote, Why is mommy crying, Uncle Hollis? Close quote. And at number ten, we've got Hypernaturals number six. Responsible for protecting the Continuum, the Hypernaturals face their biggest threat yet as the Continuum itself begins to create catastrophic problems that the Hypernaturals can't even begin to comprehend. For the best of the rest this week from DC Comics, we've got Action Comics number 15. Superman's on trial of his life, and the jury is the anti-Superman army. It's the ultimate villain springing the ultimate trap at the end of time itself. And the mystery that is built since issue number one is resolved as the little man's true identity is revealed with grave consequences. Plus, in the backup feature, a crucial piece of information is revealed. 
We've got Animal Man number 15, Rot World, The Red Kingdom, Part 3. Trapped in a horrible future controlled by the rot, Animal Man battles Grodd and his gorillas in a city they're claiming for their own. Frankenstein joins the fight, guest starring Steel and Black Orchid. Plus, find out what happened to Maxine after Buddy left with Swamp Thing to enter Rot World. Hint, it's not good. We've got Earth 2 number 7, Who is Hawk Girl? The secret is revealed. Mr. Terrific makes his first appearance on Earth 2 since he left our world, and don't miss the aftermath of the Grundy Apocalypse. We've got Green Arrow number 15, Ollie begins a downward spiral as he slowly loses everything. Betrayed and alone after the loss of Q Corp, can the Emerald Archer hold on to his arsenal? We got Phantom Stranger number three, the Stranger versus Haunted Highwaymen versus Doctor Thirteen. The Stranger's curse dictates that he must betray all those he encounters. Can he beat the odds this time? The future and the past of the New 52 collide in this issue. And we've got World's Finest number seven. Robin begrudgingly helps Huntress track down the threat to Wayne Enterprises, but little did they realize that the threat is actually tracking them. Meanwhile, Power Girl continues to explore the connection between Earth 2, Apocalypse, and this Earth, only to find herself in a standoff with a bunch of heavily armed ten-year-olds. From Marvel this week, we've got Avenging Spider-Man number 15, Delato drawing Devil Dinosaur. Done. We've got Deadpool number 3, Deadpool vs. Dead Presidents. This time it's Tricky Dick Nixon. Can even Doctor Strange help the Merc with the mouth? <laughs> this is the Deadpool series you'll marry someday. Uh, we've got Hawkeye number 5, The Tape Concludes. Someone has a deadly secret that will change the course of Hawkeye's relationship with the Avengers. We've got Iron Man number 3, the new Iron Man stealth armor debuts. The most subtle Iron Man armor of all time. Deep in Columbia, the daughter of a cartel boss is modified by extremists. Will villains Vibro, Firebrand, and the Living Laser stop Tony from doing what he must to save the world from the deadly nanovirus? An all-new era for Tony Stark from the best-selling Uncanny X-Men team of Kieran Gillen and Greg Land. We've got Punisher Warzone number 2, Kings Take Castle. Now it's his move. It takes more than bullets to take out the Avengers' biggest guns. We've got Thunderbolts number one, another Marvel Now debut. Red Hulk, Venom, Elektra, Deadpool, and Punisher. Forget the courts, the jails, the system. This team of Thunderbolts fights fire with fire, targeting the most dangerous and lethal players in the Marvel Universe with extreme prejudice. Led by General Thunderbolt Ross, a.k.a. the Red Hulk, this hand-picked team of like-minded operatives is going to make the world a better place by all means necessary. Got Ultimate Comics, The Ultimates, number 18.1. Can America recover after the dramatic events of United We Stand? President Cap takes charge. Thor's momentous decision. Perfect jumping on point for new readers. And we've got X-Men number 39. Domino teams up with Daredevil to take down Armitage. Action, adventure, romance? But whose side will Domino take in the end? From IDW, we've got Doctor Who number 3. The stress from their past few adventures have the Doctor and Rory at each other's throats, and Amy has just about had enough, so she sends them on a boy's night out, much to their chagrin, but with the TARDIS at their disposal. From Image Comics, we've got Guarding the Globe number 4. The Earth's greatest superheroes could be ravaged by an alien parasite, leaving mankind vulnerable to an even darker evil brewing behind the scenes. Also, what's been going on with OutRun? From Valiant, we've got Shadow Man number 2. Shadow Man's first night on the job may be his last. Jack Boniface has become the next Shadow Man, which would be great if he had any idea what he was doing. But he doesn't, and he's out of time. Master Dark has dispatched the terrifying Mr. Twist to destroy Jack, and the demonic creature is tearing through half of the Big Easy in search of his prey. If the Abettors, the mysterious organization that spent hundreds of years protecting New Orleans, can reach Jack first, he's got an outside shot of making it through the night. Find out if he'll live to see tomorrow as the return of the legendary Shadow Man continues. Out in trades this week from Image Comics, we've got Think Tank trade paperback. Uh, I talked about this as the series was being released. Uh, this is kind of like a real genius type comic book, if you recall that movie. Dr. David Loren is many things. Child prodigy, inventor, genius, slacker, mass murderer. When a military think tank's smartest scientist decides that he can no longer stomach creating weapons of destruction, will he be able to think his way out of his dilemma or find himself subject to the machinations of smaller men? Collecting the original series in its entirety, this trade paperback also is jam-packed with a complete cover gallery, bonus articles, behind-the-scenes sketches, and more, collecting Think Tank number 1 through 4. And from Valiant, we've got Exo Man of War Volume 1, By the Sword, trade paperback. Eric of Dacia is a brash warrior and heir to the throne of the Visigoth people. He has lived his life under the heel of the Roman Empire, but now a far more terrible enemy has come to subjugate him. Taken from his home and family, Eric is enslaved aboard a starship belonging to the brutal race of alien colonizers known as the Vine. If he's to have any hope of escaping and returning to Earth, he'll have to steal the Vine's most powerful weapon, a sentient suit of indestructible armor, and become Exo Man of War. This volume collects the first four issues of the acclaimed Breakout series by New York Times bestselling author Robert Vendetti from The Surrogates and Eisner Award-winning artist Carrie Nord. 
Well, that's it for me. This has been, as I said, an exceptional week of comics. Plenty more even yet still at your comic book shop, so be sure to check with them to see what else is out this week that you may be interested in. Uh, And let me know what it is that you're reading that I may be interested in. You can give me feedback on my Facebook blog at he'sgotissues.com, and you can also see there what I'm reading as I read it. So until next week, I'm John Cooney, and I've got issues.